And so, we'll Mr. Dreeben, I mean, uh, let's say that you win this case because the government um, presented the right to control as a property interest and now is not even defending that. All right. So I, I just want to. So let's 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 say you win. Um, but but you are saying that the government doesn't even have it right now, and I guess I wonder why that's the case. Um, uh, you know, a billion dollars is a lot of property, and uh, if you take what the government is now saying. Uh, uh, you know, frame it as this was an effort to obtain money, the most classic form of property, um, through a fraudulent scheme. So why couldn't, I know it didn't, but why couldn't the government have framed its case in that way? So, Justice Kagan, the fundamental reason why that cannot be a valid basis for property fraud is it was not the meaning of common law fraud at the time that Congress enacted the mail fraud statute and that assimilated those common law concepts. Fraud requires harm to a traditional property interest. It is usually, in government prosecuted cases, pecuniary harm. For example, the government says this could be an overcharging case. It wasn't, but if the government wanted to prosecute pecuniary fraud as an overcharging case, that fits within common law fraud. It also fits within common law fraud if the victim is deprived of another. So if, if, I, if I understand you correctly, you are saying that in addition, um, it, the government has to prove, in addition to proving that there was um, uh, a scheme to obtain property, a scheme to obtain money. The government also has to prove that on the other side there was economic loss. And I guess that strikes me as um, just a different issue, an orthogonal issue from the one that really has been raised in this case, which is um, what does obtaining property look like? Is it enough to say uh, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that there was um, interference with a right of control, that's not property. But the fact that you're trying to get contract money, that is property. And then as to all the other elements of the prosecution, whether it's what's the uh, right materiality standard, whether it's, whether it's uh, do you have to show economic loss to the defrauded party, as to all those elements, I mean, they're just not in this case at all. Didn't we basically take this case to decide <clears throat> was there a scheme to obtain property here? Well, no, there wasn't, because the government thought about it as the right to control. But yes, if the government had said they were trying to obtain a billion dollars, that would have been sufficient. So, Justice Kagan, I completely agree with the first part of what you said. This case is about the right to control and whether the right to control is a cognizable property interest that can be obtained. I would part company on whether the government can just shift to a pure fraudulent inducement theory, either in this case or as a general matter. I was answering your question about whether it is a valid theory of fraud or whether there does need to be some kind of pecuniary harm, harm to a distinctive recognized property interest of another kind. We say yes. The government says no. That was not an argument that the government made below. It's not something on which this court can look to a wealth of mail fraud cases that analyze the question. So we don't think that it's in this case. And I, to that extent, I agree with you. It is orthogonal. It's not presented. It's an improper issue before the court. If the court were to reach it, it would so have. 